initiative for health, accountability and transparency, welcome you to continue medical education course on attitudes, ethics and health communication. And this is module three, which is on health communication. Let us look at the outline of this module. It has the learning objectives, introduction of key issues, basic forms of communication. We will also talk about underlying theories and models, communication between patients and health professionals, communicating with particular groups in healthcare, communication of difficult information and also in difficult circumstances, health promotion and communicating with the wider public, and then we'll draw a conclusion. The learning objectives is that at the end of this module, participants will understand key issues and justification for effective health communication. They should be able to describe the basic forms of communication. They should understand the underlying theories and models, understand communication between patients and health professionals, understand communicating with particular populations in healthcare, understand communication of difficult information and in difficult circumstances, and finally understand health promotion and communicating with the wider public. Communication is the means by which information is impacted and shared with others. It is the transfer of information between a source and one or more receivers. Communication is central to our everyday functioning and can be the very essence of the human condition. Can anyone imagine life without communication today? Communication is essentially a process that consists of the following main elements. Two or more communicators, that is a source and a receiver, a message, the medium or means of conveying the message, the channel of communication, a code, the noise, which includes any interference with the success of the communicative act, the feedback, and the context in which the interaction of course. For the purpose of this module, we are looking at health care. This is just a diagram of the elements we have just mentioned. The figure shows a model in which the sender first develops an idea which is composed into a message and then transmitted to the other party through a channel, which in turn interprets the message and receives meaning and sends back feedback to the sender through a channel also. Developing a message is known as encoding. Interpreting the message is referred to as decoding. Health is an area where effective communication is particularly important. Good communication contributes to virtually all aspects of healthcare. It gives patients the power and confidence to engage as partners with their health service and service providers. Information helps knowledge and understanding. 
Let us look at the role of communication. Communication promotes both health and illness in the society and makes the health system and service delivery run at optimal or suboptimal effectiveness. In communication, emphasis should be on effective communication rather than on communication per se. Effective communication is generally acknowledged to be central to effective health care. It is recognized as part of the heart of patient care as playing a pivotal role and pervasive in creating, in gathering, and in sharing health information. There is evidence that patients who are managed by healthcare professionals and providers with good communication skills have better health outcomes. And that healthcare providers who communicate well with patients are more likely to secure positive outcomes for the patients, for themselves, and for others. And that they are more likely to make more accurate and comprehensive diagnoses to detect emotional distress in patients and to have patients who are more satisfied with their care and less anxious and who agree with and follow the advice given by the practitioners. In addition, patients who are dealt with by professionals with good communication skills are known to have improved health indices and recovery rates. Informing and involving patients on their case is reported to have led to significant reductions in blood pressure and also improvements in diabetic control. Let us look at the role of ineffective communication. Ineffective communication can lead to a whole range of negative outcomes, which includes patients not engaging with health service when they should, meaning that it affects health-seeking behavior, or patients refusing to follow recommended health behaviors and undergo necessary treatment, failing to cope with own or another's illness, psychological damage, physical harm, litigation, or at worst death has been connected with ineffective communication. It's also connected with patients refusing to follow recommended advice, non-adherence to treatment regimens, and patients failing to cope with the psychological consequences of their illness. Let us look at the International Convention on Health Communication. There is what we call the Toronto Consensus Statement on Health Communication. The International Conference on Health Communication is a significant event that produced the Toronto Consensus Statement on the relationship between communication practices and health outcomes. The statement is made up of eight key points. Communication problems in medical practice are important and common. Patients' anxiety and dissatisfaction are related to uncertainty and lack of information, explanation, and feedback. Doctors often misperceive the amount and type of information that patients want to receive. Improved quality of clinical communication is related to positive health outcomes. Explaining and understanding patients' concerns, even when they cannot be resolved, results in a falling anxiety. Greater participation by the patient in the encounter improves satisfaction, compliance, and treatment outcomes. The level of psychological distress in patients with serious illness is less when they perceive themselves to have received adequate information. And finally, beneficial clinical communication 
is routinely possible in clinical practice and can be achieved during normal clinical encounters without unduly prolonging them, provided that the clinician has learned the relevant techniques. Let us look at types and modes of communication. We look at communication flow. It could be downward, which means the messages flow from manager to subordinates or from provider to patients. And this is the most frequently used type of communication. You also have communicating downward can help the manager spell out objectives, can also help him to change attitudes and also mold opinions. A scenario where messages flow from one direction, from sender to recipient, without a feedback system is an inefficient and unproductive situation. There is the upward communication. This is communication which flows upward from a client or a subordinate to the supervisor or a manager. It enhances the sharing of opinions and experiences in the processes of planning, implementation, monitoring, and evaluation. Unlike downward communication, upward communication allows decision making to take place at the grassroots level, with managers being supporters and catalysts in this process. There is the horizontal communication. In this type of communication, there is lateral communication, that is between people working at the same level in the organization. This is the type of communication that connects the professionals at the same level. Messages in horizontal communication usually relate to task coordination, problem solving, information sharing, and conflict resolution. In addition, an established horizontal communication could serve as a basis for collaboration and networking with all relevant stakeholders, governmental and non-governmental, political leaders and partners. There are what we call communication channels, and communication channels are the paths through which message is transmitted from the sender to the receiver. And commonly we know the telephone is there, the radio, and also emails and internet. And today networking is rapidly becoming a major type of horizontal communication. Let us not forget that emails and social media are becoming key players in health communication today. Now we look at verbal communication and non-verbal communication. Health communication can take different forms and occur in different contexts. It can be verbal or it can be non-verbal. In terms of verbal communication, we can communicate within ourselves, that is it can be intrapersonal or with others face-to-face, -face, it can be interpersonal. Interpersonal communication can be done orally or via some medium, such as writing language or signage. Interpersonal communication is frequently carried out between two people or in a small group. Interpersonal communication is defined as the process by which information, meanings, and feelings are shared by persons through the exchange of verbal and non-verbal messages. The most common type of interpersonal communication is face-to-face -face interaction between two or more people, 
such interactions typically comprise a sequence of events and behaviors. Interpersonal communications are usually transactional in nature in that the individuals involved both affect and are affected by each other's contribution. However, in addition to these one-to-one -one or small group interactions, we also need to engage in mass communication, for example, in relation to health promotion and public health campaigns. Intrapersonal communication suddenly occurs within ourselves. Intrapersonal communications are important for processes such as self-reflection and self-evaluation. It is the key element that underlines our interactions with others. Let us look at communication in groups. Social groups occupy much of our day-to-day -day lives. Most of us work in groups, socialize or play in groups, and represent our attitudes and views through groups. And we know the definition of a group as two or more individuals in face-to-face -face interaction. Each aware of his or her membership in the group or each is aware of their membership in the group, each aware of others who belong to the same group. Groups are a vital part of people's life and provide companionship, support, and even a sense of identity, as well as helping us to perform our jobs effectively. In healthcare settings, many functions that were once provided by an individual are now team based and that groups are being used more and more among health professionals in both acute care and community settings. Looking at small group interactions, small group communication refers to the verbal and nonverbal communication that occurs among a collection of individuals whose relationships make them to some degree interdependent. Groups emerge through communication and it is in this way that they achieve their objectives. Intra-group communication is necessary for the emergence and preservation of norms and rules and as well as for compliance and consistency and the achievement of desired outcomes. Intra-group communication process is influenced by the internal structures existing within the group. Intra-group communication is the verbal and non-verbal process by which individuals form themselves into a group, maintain the group, and coordinate their effort like we see in professional associations and unions. Mass communication. Communication can also be conveyed to wider segments of the population. Much of this communication falls under the umbrella of health promotion or public health campaigns. Mass communication can occur through a number of different media, and this includes written leaflets and brochures, advertising hoardings, posters, newspapers, magazines, radios, televisions, computer systems, and the internet. Mass communication is typically a one-way process with the message going from sender to receiver. However, the increasing use of computers to disseminate health information has allowed for some degree of interactivity. Success of any mass communication campaign will depend on the message reaching the target audience and being interpreted and applied appropriately. In mass communication, the aim is to change behavior. For example, encouraging people to stop smoking, to practice safe sex, or eat more healthily, and so on. 
It is to be noted that mass communication raises a number of challenges such as identifying and reaching the right audience, ensuring that the message is appropriate for that audience and is likely to be acted upon. Let us look at some underlying theories. There are three different approaches to understanding and explaining communication. And these are process, symbiotic, and cultural studies approaches. Most communications can be accounted for using a combination of two or more approaches. Discussion on the three underlying theories are beyond the scope of this course. Participants may wish to refer to relevant resource materials on health communication. Let us look at models of health behavior. Health communication is about health behavior. There are a number of models that have been put forward to explain the way we communicate and what influences our communications and the health behavior. Not ours and not ours model is a popular model and the model specifically considers communication in the context of health. According to the model, health communication refers to transactions between participants in healthcare and about health related issues. The model emphasizes the way in which a series of factors, usually three factors, relationship factors, transactions, and context can impact on the interactions in healthcare setting. The first major element in the model is relationship, and there are four different types of relationships that exist in healthcare settings. There is the professional to professional, there is professional to client or professional to patient. There is professional to client significant others. And there is interaction between the client and significant others. Both health professionals and clients bring unique characteristics, beliefs, values, and perceptions to healthcare setting, which affect how they interact. The client significant others such as family members, friends, and work colleagues are included in the model because they have been found to play a significant role in supporting patients in relation to their health. The second element in the model is transactions, that is, the health-related interactions that occur between the various participants we have highlighted. Head transactions include both verbal and non-verbal communications, as well as the content and relationship dimensions of the messages. The relationship dimension of health transaction is established within the various relationships represented by the model. And this dimension influences how the content of the message should be interpreted. The model depicts the ongoing transactional and interactive nature of health communication, whereby the different participants influence each other's communication as an interactive progress. The model depicts the ongoing transactional and interactive nature of health communication, whereby the different participants influences each other's communications as an interaction progresses. The third element of the model is healthcare context, that is the settings in which health communication occurs. The different contexts have been shown to have a significant influence on the forum and the different contexts have been shown to have a significant influence on the form and the effectiveness of communications between the different participants. Context can refer to particular settings in healthcare, such as the waiting rooms, the hospital wards, or to the number of participants within the particular settings. This diagram clearly shows how the model works. 
We've told you about the levels of interaction, professional to professional. We have professional to clients. We have professional to significant others, and also clients to significant others. And then the health context we have mentioned before. And you can see the health transactions in the middle. In all these cases, communication variable is constant. Based on the model we have just described, you have the models of persuasion, which is based on the goal of communication. The goal of communication takes many different forms, including the elimination of an existing belief, changing the strength of a particular belief, or creation of a new belief, changing an intention to carry out an action, and changing actual behavior. Many aspects of the goal can be classified as aspects of persuasion. In general, persuasion refers to any change in attitude that results from exposure to communication. Much of health communication involves trying to persuade people to adopt particular health behaviors. There are two models of persuasion and they are the elaboration likelihood model and the heuristic systematic model. Both can be characterized as being dual process model as they both involve the use of two different processing modes or rules. Discussion on the important models of persuasion are beyond the scope of this course. Participants may wish to refer to relevant resource materials on health communication. Having looked at the models of persuasion, let us look at communication between different players. Communication can and does take place between a number of different players in the healthcare process. There are many different types of relationships in the healthcare process. In each case, communication is affected by the role each player plays and the expectations of others' roles. The quality of the relationship that exists or develops during healthcare transactions or interactions has an important influence on the smoothness and effectiveness on communication. The first we want to consider is communication between patients and health professionals. This is the most common and probably the most important in healthcare setting. Communication and the information provision play key roles in determining whether people engage in recommended health behaviors and whether the health behaviors have a positive outcome. In health communication, a number of goals may be targeted for achievement, such as providing information, instruction, assurance, influencing opinions and attitudes, and changing behavior. There are six core issues that have been identified that will need to be taken into account when planning any health communication. And it includes the purpose of the message, the state of mind of the intended recipients, including their abilities and the emotional state, the general context or climate in which the message will be delivered, the medium of communication, the feedback mechanisms to assess the effects of the communication, and monitoring and evaluation. Healthcare professionals will need to take account of many, if not all, of these factors when planning their communications with patients and others. Let us look at doctor-patient communication. The doctor-patient relationship is one of the most complex interpersonal relationships. It involves the interaction between people who are not equal in positions. It is often non-voluntary 
and they concern issues of vital importance, which is the health of the patient, and is emotional learning in most instances, and requires close cooperation between the two players. Four basic forms of doctor-patient relationships have been described. They are default, the paternalistic, the consumerist, and the mutualistic. Looking at the four basic forms, the default relationship are characterized by a lack of control on either side and are clearly far from ideal. We have the paternalism, which is characterized by dominant doctors and passive patients. And we also have the consumerism, which is associated with the reverse, with it focusing on patients' rights and doctors' obligations. Finally, we have the mutuality, which is characterized by a sharing of decision making and is often advocated as the best type of doctor patient relationship. Effective communication between doctors and patients can have many beneficial effects. It is an important determinant of accuracy and completeness of data collection about symptoms and side effects, dictates the problems elicited, affects adherence to treatment recommendations, influences emotional and physical well-being, and contributes to satisfaction of both patients and the clinicians. There are four main factors that are likely to influence the nature and the effectiveness of doctor-patient interactions. First is the character of the doctor, the sex is important and the experience, the characteristics of also the client or patient is also very important. The differences between the two parties is key in terms of social class, education, attitudes, beliefs, and even expectations. And we must not forget the situational factors, such as patient load, level of acquaintances, and nature of presenting problems. Many patients experience some degree of apprehension and even anxiety when visiting a doctor and the extent of this will influence their interactions with the doctor. Admission to hospitals can be a particularly disturbing experience. In such cases, patients often find themselves in an unusual environment separated from family members and friends with loss of personal space, privacy and independence and often feeling uncertain about their health problems and this treatment. These factors often lead them feeling very vulnerable and are likely to affect the way they interact with the health professionals. Remarkably, doctors and patients have different perspectives on the factors that they see as being most important in their relationship. There has been a number of studies where doctors and patients were asked what in their view makes a good doctor. Top three categories of what influences a patient's choice of a good doctor were how well the doctor communicates with patients and how well he shows a caring attitude. The second one is explaining the medical or technical procedures in an easy way to understand and also thirdly listening and taking the time to ask questions. While in contrast, the aspects most highly rated by doctors were the number of years of experience and whether the doctor had attended a well-known medical school. This difference in emphasis is not surprising given that the majority of doctors have been trained to adopt a very doctor or disease-centered orientation to consultations and this approach tends to continue throughout medical careers. Doctors have to communicate with patients to achieve a number of goals. Basically, there are three purposes of communication between doctors and patients, and it includes creating a good interpersonal relationship, exchange of information, and for medical decision making. There is also another aspect of communication in healthcare context and that is communication between different healthcare professionals. Different types of professionals will have different skills and expertise, 
and will often have different experience of and insight into a particular patient's medical problems. Therefore, healthcare providers need to collaborate and cooperate with each other in order to benefit patient care better. In healthcare, effective teamwork is always a challenge and three different problem areas have been identified. We have this role stress, lack of interprofessional understanding and also autonomy struggles. What do we understand by role stress? Role stress can occur when there is a conflict between the roles of professionals are expected to play and their own personal values and beliefs, or when professionals have to take on duties and tasks that they perceive are not directly related to their primary role, and when there is a role overload, for example, when number of referrals are too large or too unpredictable. There are three drivers of role stress. One is the background education factors. The training curriculum for professionals is usually profession-based, with different professionals who are being educated in isolation from the other, and with little opportunity to learn about other provider skills, roles, and responsibilities. We have the issue of limited routine interprofessional interaction. There is limited routine interprofessional interaction in healthcare settings between the different healthcare professionals on day to day basis. And finally, there are issues of autonomy struggles. There are strives to be self-directed by many allied professionals. And we know medical doctors are perceived to have much more autonomy than many other health professionals such as nurses, midwives, and others. And this has been the underlying cause of interprofessional and intercada rugby. Where autonomy struggles exist, the dominant profession often tends to underestimate the professionalism or competence of other healthcare providers, which further lead to interpersonal tension and frustration. Issues are more likely to arise in the traditional hierarchical areas of medicine, such as surgery, and less likely to occur in areas such as palliative care and community settings. Autonomy differentials, like we have mentioned, will decrease as pharmacies, nurses, and other health care professionals take on new and expanded roles such as independent medicine prescribing. Where working relationships are based on mutual respect and autonomy, this can produce a number of benefits for the professionals and also for the patients. Looking at the communication between providers and patients' families, this area is also very important. Patients do not experience ill health in fact. Patient families, friends, and carers and colleagues play an important role in relation to supporting patients and increasing their chance that positive health outcomes will be achieved. These are the patient's significant orders and are a key factor in mediating various life stresses and serious instances. The significant others affect patients' health behavior, ability to cope with illness and treatment adherence. Based on available communication, family members may cope with and adjust to a relative's illness in different ways, depending on their role and the relationship that exists within the family. Having to communicate with different family members with different levels of knowledge and different emotional states can clearly be challenging for healthcare professionals. Patients' relatives often approach and seek information from members of health team, particularly junior and more vulnerable members, in an attempt to try to get at the truth and this can cause difficulties to the medical team. Family members may or may not pass this information to the patient, 
depending on whether they feel it would be in their and the patient's best interest. If required attention and necessary information is given to the family members and friends, this significant other will be able to cooperate with staff to support the patient to achieve healthcare goals. Therefore, effective communications from and within health professionals is necessary. His family and friends are to maintain their support role in health care. However, there are two impending factors. The fact that they often have limited contact with health professionals and that their access to information can be limited. We are referring to the patient's families, what we call the significant others. Concerning access to information, problems can be of two sorts, privileged communication and filtered communication. Privileged communication occurs because in some instances, family members are provided with information by healthcare providers that has not been given to the patients. Well, filtered information refers to information that family and friends receive from the patient or other non-professional sources. Patients do not understand or they forget much of what they are told in medical consultations. Problems arise when family and other caregivers have to rely on this source of information in order to determine how best to support the patient. Another aspect of communication in healthcare setting is communicating with particular populations in healthcare. There are challenges to effective communication posed by healthcare providers having to interact with and treat various different subgroups of population. And this includes the aged patients, the young children and parents, the adolescents, people with different cultural and religious backgrounds, those with low levels of literacy and intelligence, uncommunicative patients, and angry or aggressive patients and relatives. Communicating in these circumstances require patience, perseverance, and special skills. Another category is communication of difficult information and in difficult circumstances. Health professionals may face the challenge of communicating difficult information and in difficult circumstances. Medicine and healthcare will inevitably involve the need for difficult conversation, information about the risk and uncertainty, deliver bad or distressing news, and addressing ethical issues that may arise in health communications, including those associated with truth-telling and gaining informed consent. Similarly, in this area, special skills are required to deal with uh, this situation. Let us look at health promotion and communicating with the wider public. There is general recognition that the health depends on environmental, social, and economic circumstances. These are what we call the social determinants of health. Several studies have identified cause and effect relationship between things people do or let happen and the adverse effects which could result. And the number of linkages have been well established. Health promotion is any event, process, or activity that facilitates the protection or improvement of the health status of individuals, groups, communities, or populations. Health promotion is premised on the understanding that the behaviors in which we engage and the circumstances in which we live impact on our health. Its main objectives are to prolong life or to improve the quality of life. Let us look at the roles of health professionals in health promotion. 
Medical and allied health professionals are commonly involved in communication on health promotion and disseminating information to the wider public. Most health promotion strategies are focused on primary prevention activities through the modification of lifestyle factors that account for the greatest share of the body of diseases. Key methods that have been used to address this include health education, fiscal and legislative measures, and environmental changes. Looking at health promotion strategies, there are three main strategies or approach that are commonly adopted for health promotion. It includes behavioral change approach, self-empowerment approach, and collective action approach. The behavioral change approach is based on the assumption that people are rational decision makers and that their health behaviors are informed by their cognitions. The key objective of this approach is to bring about changes in the behavior of individuals through changing their thoughts and beliefs. This typically requires increasing people's knowledge about the causes of health and illness through the provision of information about health risks and hazards. There is the self-empowerment approach. The main objective of this approach is to empower people to make healthy choices so that they can increase control over their physical, social, and internal environments. There is the collective action approach, which is based on the assumption that individuals share sufficient interest to allow them to act in the necessary collective way. This approach is more political than the other approaches and to be effective will require significant resources. Note that communication in all cases involves more than simply getting a message across. It involves building relationships and empowering people so that they can make appropriate health-related choices and decisions. There are barriers to effective health communication which we must always remember. There is the issue of low health literacy. Health literacy is very important. There is the issue of limited internet access. Internet is playing great role today in health communication. There is the issue of lack of research activity in developing countries, which is another key obstacle. There is the issue of proliferation of low quality health information on the internet. Internet is uncontrolled. So the volume of internet contents increases on the daily basis. Therefore, consumers will need help in evaluating the reliability of the information available on the internet. And finally, the issue of inability of health workers to communicate effectively with patients due to various communication hurdles such as language barrier, social cultural differences, etc. How do we overcome barriers of communication in healthcare setting? Taking the receiver more seriously, making the message very clear, delivering message skillfully, focusing on the receiver, using multiple channels to communicate instead of relying on just one channel, ensuring appropriate feedback, and be aware of your own state of mind, emotions, and attitudes. Let us take an assignment on health communication. Why are communication problems in medical practice important and common? Online submission to be marked health com assignment of not more than 500 words to iHeartNigeria at gmail.com. Concluding this model, it is important to note that health is an area where effective communication is particularly important as good communication contributes to all aspects of healthcare. 
effective communication between medical and healthcare professionals and patients can have many beneficial effects. Effective health communication is an important determinant of the accuracy and completeness of data collection about symptoms and side effects. It dictates the problems elicited, affects adherence to treatment recommendation, influences emotional and physical well-being, and contributes to satisfaction of both the patients and the clinicians. Medical professionals have to communicate with patients to achieve a number of different goals. Studies have identified top three categories of what influences a patient's choice of good medical professional. Our dream for a strong health system and better health outcomes will remain a dream unless we work for it. Working for it requires strong leadership, effective management, and transparent governance.